Okay, we're good to go. Very good. Good evening. Welcome to the River Falls Utility Advisory Board meeting for November 19th, 2020. We're at a couple minutes past 6.30 and call this to order and we'll begin with a roll call. Roll call. More set. He's in and out. He's trying to get here, so I would include him as. Let's try probably. that. There he is. <laughs> yep. I can't get video to work, but I'm here. I'm here. We'll record you as here. Richter. Here. Saffer. Here. Swanson. Toom. Here. Wells Mangold. Here. All right, I'm going to look for approval of the minutes from the October 19th meeting. I get a motion. Motion to approve the minutes from October 19th meeting. And I'll second that. Very good. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Uh, do we have any public comment at this time? Yes, we do. We have Ms. LaRue coming Very up good. to the podium. All right. Good evening and welcome, Mr. Burning. My name is Patricia LaRue. I live at 489, 489 Marcella Court. And I'm here tonight to tell you that the River Falls Municipal Utilities has a birthday coming up. Uh, let me take you back to the late winter, spring of the year 1900. The River Falls Common Council voted to be the first city outside of only Minneapolis to provide hydropowered electricity to her residents. At the time, the city was not able to uh, issue sufficient bonds to pay for the enterprise. So two River Falls banks stepped up. The banks financed the purchase of the burnt out junction mill property, paid for the electrical poles, the stringing of the electrical wires. They built the new power plant and erected a rock crib and timber dam, hydroelectric dam. By November of that year, and on November 29th, 1900, the switch was flipped and River Falls was powered by hydroelectricity. It was an amazing accomplishment and only because we had an innovative city leaders and um, also that the, the uh, banks leased the property to the city until they were able to afford to pay it. And then um, at that time, the community has owned and uh, operated the junction mill hydroelectric power plants for 120 years. There was a story I read in a letter of a woman. She was telling how she was a young girl at the time and everything would be fairly very dark when you would come into town and the, the street lights would just sparkle. And um, she commented on how amazing that was. But there's one more birthday. Um, the River Falls Municipal Utilities in 1920 the city needed more electricity, so it constructed a cement dam, which was higher. They built it in front of the rock crib and timber dam. And because it was higher, it created Lake George. So this year, Lake George is 100 years old. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And that's all we have for public comment. Okay, thank you, John. All right, we're gonna move on to the consent agenda. We're looking to acknowledge the following minutes. The, the West Central Wisconsin Biosolids Facility Commission. That's what we have tonight. We got a motion to approve. Thank you, approve the Scott. consent agenda. Thank you, Scott. I'll second it. Okay. Scott, in keeping with our conversation, do we need to pull anything? <laughs> uh, you'd actually ask no. to have stuff pulled before you got the approval, but before the approval. I don't think so. Okay, okay. I, didn't I didn't either, but I want to <laughs> get this figured out. So thank you. Um, we have our, our uh, first and second. All in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, now for our big topic, our new business. 
Point three, the West Central Biosolids contract consideration. Uh, it seems as if everyone's watched the meeting from Tuesday, if not participated. So I believe we're up to speed. Uh, Kevin, do you want to start us off here? Yeah, I can. I think I think the heavy lifting on this has been done on Tuesday night with a two-hour and 22-minute meeting. So we did a little bit of a straw poll. Um, to just one a second. John, can you mute the council chambers? You see in the council chambers or not? It's just a little background noise. Oh, there we go. Thanks, John. Anyway, um, so we did a little bit of a straw poll at the end of Tuesday night to try to get a feel for uh, how the Utility Advisory Board and City Council may want to proceed with West Central Biosolids. So I wrote up a resolution today and I forwarded that to you. Actually, I did a revised version. I had one small change late in the afternoon. And I'm gonna go ahead and read that. I think I captured exactly um, what we uh, had talked about on Tuesday night. I'll summarize what I captured, captured before I read it, re read it. I think what we wanted to tell West Central Biosolids by, the end, by January 8th of 21 was that we are not going to renew the contract with them at this time but we did want to leave the option open if we were able to negotiate with them and stakeholders and find a way to still renew with them and be part of their facility. So I tried to capture that in a resolution. So again, we're notifying them that we're not going to renew, but keeping the door open for conversations that may allow us to renew in the near future. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to read this resolution and then, um, then you can do what you want with it, Patrick. So I'm going to read resolution approving the ability for River Falls Municipal Utilities to preserve the right to not renew a 20-year contract extension with West Central Wisconsin Biosolids Facility. Whereas River Falls Municipal Utilities became an owner and member of West Central Wisconsin Biosolids along with 10 other in 1995. And whereas the most recent contract expires in 2025. And whereas West Central Wisconsin Solids is requesting each member to commit to a 20 year contract extension by January 8th of 2021. And whereas River Falls Municipal Utilities uh, commissioned a, a finance, financial and facility analysis to evaluate building and maintaining their own biosolid storage facility. And whereas River Falls Municipal Utilities will need more time to conduct additional analysis and engage in collaborative stakeholder discussions in order to determine the most prudent course of action. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Utility Advisory Board recommends that the River Falls Municipal Utilities does not commit to a contract extension at this time, and be it further resolved that the Utility Advisory Board hereby advises the Common Council of River Falls to authorize the city administrator to send Western, West Central Wisconsin Biosolids notice to inform them of this decision while maintaining the option to commit to an extension at a future date, dated this 19th day of November, 2020. So Patrick, that is the resolution that I wrote, wrote up and I'm, I'm hoping it's reflective of what I heard on last Tuesday night. I think I hit the mark with that. Can uh, can you share? I know the mayor asked to see it. Has there been much input? I, I assume. I mean, it, it, that sounds much better than a rough draft. I'm I'm thrilled with it. But can you share how far it's gone? Uh, it, it hasn't gone anywhere except here. And I just I, I had I didn't get time to get that to the mayor today. So okay, okay. So we're, well, good job. I, but I so. did talk. But I did talk with uh, Assistant City Administrator Jason Stroud about it. And him and I did a little collaboration over emails between meetings today. Okay, uh, but we're looking for the, I mean, to have an action item of, of basically saying, pass this to the city council. Correct. Correct. And then if, if they don't like it, they could always modify it or change it, but so. Very good. Just a comment, Kevin, you said maybe you purposely left off or, or didn't think about, but uh, in, in, in resolutions like this past, 
And we'd see administrator or designee would be the only other would be the only comment I have. Other than that, I'm fine with the resolution. I understood from Jason, and Jason, you can chime in if you're not eating chicken. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> um, that uh, you know, the city policy says admin city administrator, but there might be another another designee if they if you're comfortable with that, Jason. Yeah, um, we did actually talk about this, and I talked with Mr. Simpson today, and just and just kind of in terms of the policies and procedures that council had has had in place to date only the city administrator can officially contract on behalf of the city or or their therefore not contract on behalf of the city so that's why we wrote it that way okay that's 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 fine i just like i said i just want to make sure we're exploring those it sounds like you've already thought those through so yep. that's fine um so I, 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 Go ahead. I, I don't have much else to add to that other than our discussion and then bringing forward, summarizing our thoughts from Tuesday. So if you need to modify that, change it, not do it, it's up. That's the will of the utility advisory board this evening. Um, my only concern is that we don't rush this. Uh, we, we talked about it at length on Tuesday. Uh, your, what you've written is certainly in the spirit of what was shared and we Granted, we, we straw polled our intentions, which is entirely unofficial, but we were generally in agreement that it would be good to have a little exploratory time. Uh, you've represented that perfectly. So I just want to leave a moment here to, are there any further questions, any discussion we need to have? Going once. <laughs> uh, I, have a, I have a quick comment. Um, Kevin, I uh, and I need to work with John on this, but I am not getting city emails right now. So I haven't seen the resolution. I've only heard you read it. Um, okay, so here's what, Mark, if you could email me or send me your the email that works best for you, I will make sure to get that to Lene and get you on the route list. We have a master route list. That we have added some people on there or different email addresses. And if you're not getting that, we, I'll make sure that we get your correct email on there to get you the information. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting um, everything except for I did not get this. So, yes, Lene has been gracious enough to include my home email. Um, I have a lot of reservations. I was not able to stay through the whole two hour and 20 minute discussion. Um, I wrote down a number of cons and a few pros. Uh, is is there going to be an opportunity to, to vote on this or is this going directly into Mr. Simpson's hands? So the way this would work is the utility advisory board would advise the council to do what the resolution says and the council on it, and then Scott would move forward with what the council wished to do. So if we have some reservations, do we share those with the council um, offline? I think, right now, I think now, or yeah, I think you could voice them right now. It'd be appropriate. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just read off of a, a couple here. I've, I've got a pretty good list. I've really thought this through since Tuesday. Um, the neighboring and partnering, the concern of mine that we originally got into the team of 11. And uh, this will definitely put a hardship on, because we are 18.5% of the team. Um, Another reservation I had was that this is, and correct me if any of this I say, Kevin, is wrong, that this is not in the budget, that this is above and beyond our budget. Correct. Um, neither neither the neither bu us building a facility is in our capital improvement plan or funding West Central Biosolids is neither in our capital improvement plan yet at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, the trucking rate, um, you know, Mr. Simpson spoke about uh, a geographically central, meaning that everybody 
pays the same trucking rate. Um, there's some some uh, increases in in trucking. Ron mentioned that a potential of 82% increase unless we put it out for bid. I was hoping that we might know a number for the bid prior to making a decision. Um, I think the big one for me is, well, we're looking at Powell and Junction Falls dams being removed. And this will most likely cost the taxpayers millions of dollars at this point, because we have no commitment from any of the stakeholders. Um, we're adding an extra 0.61 employee. Um, some of the some of the the cons of going by ourselves is that um, if there if there is something that comes from the DOT or the DNR, we're we're in this by ourselves. So we take all that burden, all that risk. Um, if we're with a team, a group of 21, then we can spread that around. Um, I think for me, it's the removal of the dams right now. Uh, I I just think we we have no we have no movement there. We haven't heard anything different other than a month or so ago, uh, and there's no money coming in, and there's no commitment. So I I just a little nervous about stretching ourselves out. So I think that's those are my comments. Scott, could you go over what uh, Mr. Simpson shared as far as um, our debt picture and and his confidence that I, I mean I, I believe I'm sharing it accurately when I say confidence that we could handle those things to come. I mean he was talking about our just our overall debt picture and pro other projects, the North Interceptor being included. Um, could, you yeah. review, could you review that for Mark a little bit? Yeah, let me, I, I wrote I wrote some of these down, Mark, and so just, just to go, just uh, hopefully I got picked them up here, but um, your your concern about the partnership is, is a valid one. Uh, the mayor was pretty adamant um, that we should not let the partnership situation impact what's best for the city of River Falls. And I share that point of view. Um, uh, while we want to have good partnerships with Hudson and New Richmond and the 21, the 21 uh, other ent uh, municipalities involved in this, we, we are put in place to make decisions that are best for the, for the citizens, residents, and ratepayers of the city of River Falls. So uh, I, I understand your concern there. That, that emotion is one that I think a few of us have had. Uh, but I think we need to put that aside. The not in the budget piece was one that I raised um, a question about, and just not to by any means to try to give a, um, a city finance seminar here, but but this is there are revenue funds and there are general obligation uh, funds or general there's the general obligation or the general fund is what it's referred to. So revenue funds, which is where this would come from, would be things that generate their own money. In fact, they, what they do is they run like their own business unit. And Kevin, in his in his world and utility, has got, I mean, I get to all these right, Kevin. He's got water, he's got electric, he's got sewer and storm water. Am I missing anyone? Um, That's it. That, those are the four, yeah. So, so each of those units run as an individual business. Uh, they have a separate balance sheet. They have a separate income statement. They have separate debts and they have separate bond ratings, as a matter of fact. So even if we stay, if we stay with West Central Wisconsin and go into this, what's really up in the air right now is how are they going to fund it as well? Uh, we've heard that they probably will go to each of the separate uh, municipalities and say, you go get your percentage of the total amount and bring it in and give it to us, which gets kind of clunky, to be honest with you. Um, and so that that whole piece is 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 a question mark that 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 has yet to be answered. And I think to Kevin's wording, Kevin and Jason's wording in the in the resolution, you know, we need to find out more about that and how that works. Cause that 
to today, I don't think has been well thought through. And they probably, uh, not that they've been neglectful in thinking it through, but they haven't really thought through that because they haven't had to yet. Um, you know, it's five years down the road. They're just looking for the, for the initial renewal today. So the, the fact that it's not in the budget, uh, the the stormwater budget and there were there was a lot of modeling that was done by um, tri trilogy. Is that who it was Kevin? Yes, so, so correct trilogy. So we we've, we've used trilogy in the city for a bunch of different things. I think they do a pretty good job. And um, trilogy did some modeling for us to show us what the rates are going to do inside of the stormwater. I'm sorry, the wastewater fund. So just it, just to sort of spill over to your concern about Junction Falls and, and Powell, that's a that's a real concern. Those 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 uh, can, those those revenues and expenses are actually in a different revenue fund. Those are in those are in the electric fund. Uh, now that doesn't mean that it makes it any softer on the bill if we have to raise both of them. To your point, but I think we're we're getting set up in somewhat of a fashion to address the, the Powell, the Powell falls dam. Uh, it's true. We don't have anything in place yet, but I think there are, I do believe, I do have confidence that there is uh, a fair amount of grants out there and so forth that we are just now starting to explore for those. Uh, the trucking increase, I think that's coming next year anyway, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Kevin? Uh 22 so it'll be oh, 22 okay uh, but they're already but they already gave us a proposal which is an 82 percent increase for july 1 of 22. okay so we already know in 22 we're going to have that jump and and true we don't have a bid we don't have a competitive bid to, to look at there so consequently we're we're you know we're <laughs> we would be dealing with that we would be dealing with that anyway uh between now and the yeah, I mean, you got to remember, this isn't going to happen for another five years. So we're going to be living with whatever happens between now and that five-year period anyway. Um, so adding the FTE, 0.61, you know, again, we got five years down the road. We've got other other things going on. That, that could or could not be a real issue for that. But, um, you know, that, that 0.6 FTE could be, uh, you know, a full-time person who morphs into another part of that job doing something else, um, you know, and, and is, we have a lot of that in the city where somebody, uh, I'm thinking of like Mike Noreen, who, who is the forester and the conservation. So he gets paid out of two different sort of pots, if you will, but still gets paid from the city. Go Scott, ahead, Kevin. Let, me, let me add one thing to that too. If you remember, Strand and Associates had included that, that funding in their estimates so that was that's not outside of our initial estimates that's included in the estimates uh -huh. there you go um the, the 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 point you brought up about partners and and changes and uh, we're in it alone is a is a valid point and i think that's a policy discussion that 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 warrants some some ex exploration i mean i uh i talked a little bit with with uh, council member odean uh, the other day before the meeting and said, here's my concerns. Where are you at? And she had some of the same concerns. You know, if, 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 as we witness the DOT decides on a whim to change their, their, their policies on, on uh, what we can and can't truck and how much we can and can't truck uh, we're in it alone. Um, you know, if, if the DNR decides that, you know, we have to uh, stand on one leg on every Tuesday and jump around at noon and, we don't have a choice. We're all by ourselves. And so we do lose a little bit of a voice, if you will, um, uh, by being a single, by being a single entity rather than in, involved in a consortium like we are. So I think that's a val I think, I think your concerns are valid, Mark. I just, I think that some of them are, um, uh, have been addressed or were discussed and I'm not sure where you had to fall off last night in the meeting, but those are my those are my comments. I don't know, Pat, if that's what you were looking for, or if that was way more than you wanted, or what. But. That was that was pretty well what we're looking for. Um, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, uh, just a couple of follow ups. I, I also heard Mr. Simpson mention that um, about a nine million dollar potential grant. 
that the biosolids facility could maybe get their hands on? Does anybody remember the? Yeah, I do. So let me elaborate on, on that. So, Mark, that's why I think uh, we wrote the resolution to leave the door open. We feel like we need to give them a five year notice if we are to not renew. And that's why we're feeling some urgency to let them know by January 8th or the end of the, or the end of this year. But we do want to leave the door cracked open to these options. And one of them that you just mentioned, is there state funding out there that we haven't explored that would really reduce the cost of a West Central biosolids construction? Is there a smaller project that they can do that would reduce our costs? Is there a, is there a trucking, a competitive trucking bid that would reduce costs? So I just think we just need a little more time with them to see if they're, if they're willing to explore some of these things to help reduce costs, to make that option more palatable. Because right now through the financial analysis, it's $4 million more expensive than us doing it ourselves. So we have got to bring that number down. So we want to buy ourselves a little bit of time, leave the door open for us to go back to West Central and say, hey, uh, we're we're serious serious and, and serious about not renewing, but before we fully commit to not renewing, we want to explore some other options with you to see if we can bring the cost of this down. Thanks. That's really Thank where we're at. Yep. Um, uh, one more one more thing, Patrick. Is that all right? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. I'll I'll be real quick. And Kevin, uh, I I know Ron is on, but um, he might be able to answer for him. So. 99.5% of our wastewater is water moisture. Well, it comes in, and we treat it through the biological process and the enzymes, whenever we can make it back into clean water through the biological yep. process. And so 0.5% is solids, 97% of that 0.5% is water. Correct. Um, and so my question would be if the biosolids facility upgraded because mm -hmm. Ron was very clear about they can only accept a 3%. They yes. can't even go to four or five. Yeah. Could we, we, we reduce we our upgrade. trucking if they upgrade their system so we can haul so, stuff that's a little more solid? So that would be a goal. So we, even now, we, we, Ron pushes it to three and a half, three, seven, five, and they have, a, they have trouble moving the product. Ron, do you want to chime in and, and Will their new systems allow us to bring them a thicker sludge run? He's coming in right now. Yeah. So the new system, that part of it isn't going to change. It's still going to be a four or less. Um, so, uh, yeah, that that is really going to change that whole centrifuge process that needs that that amount of sludge in the trucking. The trucks aren't going to change. It's the same same trucking. So. Basically, that will not change from what it is currently. All right. Thank you, Ron. I can't right, remember you. everything from the uh, entire two plus hour extravaganza that it was. Um, can somebody help refresh my memory um, if the if they decide to make some upgrades over the next five years while we're still in this contract we're still on the hook for that plus if we decided to go and build a facility ourselves or uh, i just can't remember that exact point well that's that's a really good point but in, in talking to ron it sounds like west central biosolids is not quite as aggressive in, in getting their project started in like a 22 or 23 as they were once talking about it's probably going to be more of a 24, 25, possibly even 26 before they get going. Um, but we would do everything we could to have them drag their feet because we don't want to be investing millions of dollars and then get out in a year. So that has been brought up. But Ron, you can answer that maybe a little more eloquently than I just did. But it sounds like they're not quite as eager to get going quite as quickly. Do you want to elaborate on that, Ron? Uh, yeah, so the other end of that, you know, I think they're originally shooting for 23. It, it would be tough with everything you have to do, facility plans, approvals, um, contractors, purchasing equipment. That'd be hard to do. Uh, but the other thing with that is, is there's a whole weighted boat system with biosolids that would apply in this situation because they're going out to get financing. 
So 20% of the members, basically 80% of the membership would vote for this to go through. Well, we're right almost at that 20% that you would need to basically stop the project. So, yeah, I mean, that is kind of the fallback. And I think Scott did address that a little bit the other night too, when he talked about that, that that was gonna be, you know, that was gonna be one of the things we were watching for. Um, obviously, we don't wanna spend the money twice, so. But it's not a guarantee that we wouldn't have to spend the money twice. I don't think, no, I don't know. To me, it wouldn't be 100% guarantee. It, okay. Uh, Though, though, with that said, it wouldn't be the full the full nut of the West Central project. It'd be a good upfront portion potentially. Um, I, I mean, the spirit of your resolution is is essentially we're asking West Central to be more competitive for our sake. Uh, if they rise to that occasion, we're we're hoping to have the open door to respond to that. Correct. If they, if they do not rise to that occasion, we're saying, look, the numbers that we're looking at to do our own thing are, are advantageous to us. We're trying to communicate early and be as neighborly as we can be while backing out. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I, I, I feel good about how we're approaching this. Um, and I, I'd like to see us get to a vote here, but I, before doing that, uh, any, any further questions or concerns? I would, just like, I would just like to reiterate what this really what this does is it gives them notice of why we're not renewing, but we would like to continue the conversation and look for a way to make it work. Mark, do you understand? Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. All right, I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve. The resolution uh, that Kevin read. Second. Thank you. All right. No. For, all right. Any further discussion before voting? Very good. I, I do take this one with some seriousness. I I hope we've. Uh, we, we are leaving ourselves some room, but this is this is an important topic. So uh, I will proceed with a vote. Those in favor of accepting the resolution, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Same sign. All right, seeing none. All right, we can proceed from there. Kevin, go ahead and- Yeah, we're just gonna say, I, I just wanted to, Patrick, that this is a serious deal. And I will with and Ron, both Ron and I will in good faith be working with West Central to try to find a way to make it work. Um, I'm not 100% sure what they're going to do, but we're going to try. Okay, thank you for that. All right, we're going to move on to the reports. We've got the, the, the next big topic, the Lake Louise drawdown update <laughs> and dam inspection overview. <laughs> The hits just yeah. keep on coming. Yeah. I'm telling you, my gosh, end of the year. So, <laughs> so Peter Haug uh, from Ayers is here again tonight. We're going to do a couple things tonight. One, we're going to go over and talk a little bit. We're going to revisit where we left off last month. We had a few questions regarding Lake Louise and sediment and um, the study that Marty's group did at Interfluve. And I know Peter has uh, been communicating with Marty. It's got a little more data. So Peter's going to clean up some of the questions regarding um, sediment in Lake Louise. And then Pete did a real nice job doing a full inspection of Powell Falls Dam then laying, and then laying out some scenarios of how we move forward. We're not asking anybody to uh, select anything tonight. But this board, uh, the Utility Advisory Board and City Council are going to meet on January 19th for another work session to look at those three scenarios and probably pick one to move forward. Basically, are we refilling Lake Louise or not refilling Lake Louise and how are we going to get that done? 
But Pete is going to give you some teasers on that tonight as well with his inspection report. So without further ado, Mr. Peter Haug, if you would take it away and talk about sediment in Lake Louise to start. Sure. So and I thank you. Are you Dr. able Howell. to are you are you able to share your screen, Pete? I am. Do you want to see my screen? Yeah, let's do that. I would love to see it. All right. You have some good um, good graphics on there anyway. Bear with me here. I'm not used to it. Yeah, and John, if you need to coach him along, that'd be okay too. Yeah, he should he should have the ability now to do that. So okay. Up to the menu and share. Go. Share. All right. So I've got my picture of what we saw basically got it. prior to you know, the meeting with Kevin where I said, Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's drawn down now, but um, I did not expect this. So I'm gonna get the report open that you guys have in your minutes. Hopefully you've got that too. So, and thank you to Hal Watson. I don't know if he's on the call tonight, but he had some very good questions and they made me think a lot more about where did we get our data and, and what do we think about the data and how it impacts our decisions forward. So uh, first off, last time we showed a picture like this and we said, well, originally we had expected that the channel number one would not cut this deep. And where did that come from in your minutes? And scroll down, you'll see that there is a, a plot on page four of six, the top of page four of six. And this plot was in my head at the time I said, hey, I can't believe um, it cut as much as it did. So then the questions became, where did this plot come from? You know, we've we based our estimates of where the, the river is going to cut, how many cubic yards are going to come out of this lake based on what's called a refusal surface. And you can determine a refusal surface by probing, which is shutting a steel rod down through the bed. You can determine it by a geophysical method, such as um, ground penetrating radar or seismic methods or sub bottom profiling. But at the end of the day, whether you're doing it by hand or you're doing it electronically, you're ending up with a, a, a judgment call. And so whether that refusal is when you push down with 30 pounds of force or it's that you know eighth squiggly line down from the surface, that's your refusal. There's some judgment there. So I think it's, it's something we want to make clear that we're not casting doubt on interface methods. We're just saying that the, the channel out there is behaving differently and therefore we need to update our knowledge about what's going forward. So with that said, we expected uh, elevation 809 in front of the powerhouse. We got 805. So we did survey that in the field. So it was four feet lower in front of the powerhouse. You see in the report, basically, there's an assumption of where the channel is going to be on the bottom of page two of six. And that channel is, it's anyone's guess. So when you're designing these dam removal projects and you have a, a contour map in front of you of refusals, you know, it looks like interview basically went to the deepest holes and connected that with the spillway. But that's not what we saw. So on the picture on the screen, you can see the, the river channel basically cut from the west edge of what I'm calling the reed bed, almost in a straight line down to the powerhouse. And so looking at that plot on the bottom of page two of six, my point to Kevin was if the river has already cut this deep and it's not made this curve to the deepest part, there's more volume being moved out of here. And again, that's that's what we struggled with. What is that change? And I had estimated 80,000 yards. I, I believe that number is still correct. That as a whole, we had thought that there would be somewhere around 45,000 yards of mobile sediment in this lake. But after looking at the contours now and how much deeper it cut, I think you're probably closer to 80. On page three of six, can see raw data we were able to obtain this from a partner that was used on the last project and so some of these elevations on here like 812 and 809 you can see running down the middle of the, of the page on page three you look at those same elevations on the following page and you're like we're a lot deeper so we're not a lot deeper i should say we're several feet deeper and unfortunately on an area as big as this every extra couple feet that you cut, you, know, you could be 10,000 yards. So what does all this mean? 
I think the, the best summary I had was on the bottom of page four. We did not find a historical waterfall. You can look on this picture here in front of me and, and opine that perhaps maybe 500 feet upstream, there may still be some waterfall remnant, but it certainly isn't very tall. Um, you can say that maybe they dredged through this waterfall because honestly, this dam was built, I think somebody had mentioned earlier, in the early 1920s or so, Powell Falls. And that was modified in 1947 with a new powerhouse, had a new spillway in 1968 or so. A lot of modifications have been made to this dam over the years. And it could be reasonable that to expect that they blasted a channel if there was a waterfall here between one of these you know, buried cliffs of mud. But we have not found that to date. Uh, my second bullet point is the initial incision developed down the middle of the lake bed rather than the curve. But that's not really great news because these channels are not stable. And so it could be, and I think River Sky Drones produced a great video and we'll talk about that later, Kevin, but it shows a time lapse almost of the, the lake bed. And you can see that this channel is starting to migrate eastward. So for me, that says it cut right here to begin with because that was probably the straightest shot, shortest path, but it may stabilize where even interfluid is shown over there on the far east side. So we don't know that yet. Are you, are you gonna show that video? That's a good video. If All you right. can, you should show that. That's it's a minute, but it's it's yeah. worth it's worth it. That's right. I'm gonna try here. Is it coming up? Now we're gonna test your bandwidth. That's right. The so June twentieth. It's only about two minutes long here, but so the July fourth, free flood. This is after the flood. You can see a big sandbar in the middle of the lake. All right, so first day of drawdown. First day of drawdown, I just want you to see that right away, one of the things that might be influenced in the way this river cut is this big bar of sand that came out from the wastewater plant. That was not in the survey from 2016. So these next images will go a little faster. This is October 3rd, so second day of drawdown. October 4th, but you see how straight this river is cutting. October 8th, I believe was the last day before the big rain and then October 15th was after that big rain. I'm gonna stop it right here. So October 18th was the day before the meeting that we had last time. So again, this is pretty much take that powerhouse. And here's the, uh, I'm calling the west bank of the reed bed, pretty much a straight line. And we don't have any more survey data. I was able to, to, to get a survey point here around the wastewater plant just downstream and I was able to get shot right in front of the powerhouse on the riverbed at this end. And I, I, for that plot that I've gotten a report, it's just a straight line. So it does not include the meanders. Let's keep going here because I believe there's a couple more views. Watch right at the bottom there, how much the river is meandering. So November 2nd is the last image. You can see this river is starting to cut, you know, maybe 50 to 100 feet more to the east. So Kevin has that video. I don't know if we need to watch it again, but in summary, I think River Sky Drones images of this lake are valuable because they can tell us whether or not this is stable. And based on what they've shown us, it is not. I found my other image here. Yeah, there it is. So, so Pete, any surprises for you looking at that, at those images and being an expert and seeing this happen before? Do you, any takeaways for you personally that went, oh my gosh, I've never seen that? So I mentioned this last time we did a Gordon Dam removal and we had plotted, it's a probably similar size impoundment to Lake Louise. And we had plotted a straight line channel right through the middle um, and because the bed was completely flat. So we had done refusals and we found that the sediment was only you know, a couple feet deep in, in places. So we thought we had a good chance of having the channel go straight through the, the middle. And it made a huge C curve all the way around the, the perimeter of the basin. So it's not an exact science. And when I look at this channel, it's on the picture in front of you. This is not stable. I know it's not stable. The river needs to develop these meanders to get enough length so that the stream power is, ba is balanced. So 
the sediment cutting is a function of the stream power and these, these relationships. So it needs to be a longer channel to become more stable. And that's why you get these S curves. So I think it's gonna keep cutting. Um, I think that cutting is a concern as we can talk about later with the DNR and Trout Unlimited, this persistent migration of these banks either eastward or flattening out wider to you know from vertical slopes like you see to something that's flatter that's your source of sediment for the next couple of years pete i got a quick question what's what do you think the dynamic of the river is going to do when because right now it's going through a six by six opening what's going to happen when we remove any impediment to flow at all is it going to meander again i would expect it too find the path of least resistance might be more to the west again. So the stable meander is going to be driven by, it's going to accelerate the, the, so the, the wider the opening in the dam, the faster it's gonna reach an equilibrium. So right now we've, we've choked this river with this gate so that it's going to be a little bit slower, but you can see this river is basically free flowing, maybe a couple hundred feet upstream of the, the dam here during normal flow events. But most of this major channel forming is going to occur at either a bank full or somewhere near bank full capacity where the water is up almost to the top of the banks. So this normal flow that we see right here is not going to be responsible for the major shifts in this channel. If we take this dam out, we are gonna have the ability to have this channel move 100 feet in a day, left or right. So one of the things that we had a call earlier with the DNR is the option to either continue drawing down with the six foot gate or continue drawing down with a larger opening. And my caution to them was, once you cut that opening in the dam, you lose the ability to choke the flow. So whatever cutting happens in the future, if it's runaway cutting, we can't stop it. At least now with this gate in place, we could shut the gate if something that we didn't like was happening. We think, think we can shut the gate. I think we, right, right. Um, so I think to, let's save that discussion until we talk about the inspection. Okay. At the end of this report on page five, I wanna show these numbers because I think there's a lot of confusion about it last time when I was talking about doubling of values and what this means, where these come from. So we we had the actual can, AutoCAD file. Can you pull that up too, Pete? Put it on the screen here for those that don't have a double screen at home. Thank can you. Can you see that? So you can see this on my yeah, screen. That's good. Oh, that's really good right there. <laughs> All yeah. right. Even I can see that. <laughs> so, uh, these are based on AutoCAD. So AutoCAD takes in points and these points are created in a surface. And I caution that a lot of the issues and differences in how errors and interfleet are gonna interpret this is how we use the boundaries of this. So one thing that we did right off the bat was we ran our surface all the way down to the dam, adding in where we think the river is cutting today. So when you see these numbers going across here, 45,100, 66,000, these are based on AutoCAD measurements of volume. And so they take the 2016 sonar data is the surface minus where we think it's going to cut. So this is not exactly right, right? Because we had a big flood between these two events. So this is just a comparison of apples to apples. 2016 is the base surface to where we think it's going to cut. So I think the big number I want you to see is this liability removed during construction. Just because we see this river cutting deeper does not mean that we are necessarily going to have to remove more sediment later. Because of the fact that we drew it down early, we are releasing a lot of sediment early. We've probably already released 8,000 yards and we will probably still release another 25,000 yards, at least another three events or so between now and when we decide to remove this dam, if we continue to 2023 or 2024. So that's subtracted. And I know that the DNR and a lot of people would like to go ahead and immediately remove this dam, but there is a benefit to the city, an economic benefit of a slow removal, as long as it isn't of a such magnitude that you have to mitigate it and remove it from the downstream channel. 
So yes, while I believe there's probably 80,000 yards in there that is mobile, that could be released, I believe we're going to slowly release about 40% of that. And so we will probably end up with the same liability that we had in the beginning, the assumption of 47,000 yards, and that's gonna be the liability associated with cutting the channels back to stabilize their width. Um, I believe Interfluve wrote it well that this, this stream reach wants a 55 foot wide bottom width. And we're going to, on areas that are too narrow and still cutting, we'll have to widen that stream out. On banks that are steep and vertical, we'll have to flatten them out to three to one or four to one. So there is a liability in there. We also still have to pull all the sediment away from the dam so we can physically get construction equipment in there to remove it. The other liability that I think is very important to remember is we still have to be cognizant of the volume that comes down from the South Fork and from Junction Falls over the next two and a half years of construction. So there's possibly, I think I had somewhere between five and 10,000 yards a year. So I took an average of that. I got uh, 22,000 yards or so of sediment that are probably coming through our work site that wasn't from Lake Louise. So these numbers, again, I think my conclusion to how was it's too early to say, does this knowledge that we learned change our opinion of the cost of the project? I don't think so. I think we're still in that $1.9 million range, um, give or take 20% because we're still so uncertain. Can I just, I want to interject one thing and then Scott, you go And I know Marty, I think is on the phone with Interflu. And I just want to publicly apologize to Marty. I'm just going to own this. this is last time we may have been a little critical and asked some over critical questions of Marty Interflu. Interfluve. Interfluve is a very reputable, great company. Marty has done great work for us. And uh, Marty, I hope you can accept my apologies if you felt like we uh, were a little too critical of you last time. So uh, apologize. Scott, Marcet. Um, so Pete, so have you shared, have you shared these sediment numbers, uh, the, 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 the 8,000, uh, well, the 8,000 is already pretty much gone, uh, but the 25,000 um, cubic uh, cubic yards that, that we think are going to shift or move or continue to flow downstream with the DNR, and what's been their reaction to that? This is <clears throat> such a hot topic. I mean... Yeah, I figured as much. That's why I asked the question. Yeah, I, <laughs> we were 90 minutes on the phone this afternoon discussing this. <laughs> I was just looking for my notes from that call, Kevin, because I was like, both the DNR and Trout Unlimited said, we want to maximize the flow going downstream to push out sediment that's already down there, but we want to minimize the sediment that's being passed downstream. And those are competing. Can't maximize the flow that's coming out of the dam. I don't know, just... Everybody wants to have less sediment moving downstream, but at the end of the day, the question that the DNR should ask is, is 25,000 yards over a whatever, three and a half year period here, is that unacceptable? And I've heard lots of statements that are qualitative about how there's a lot of sediment that's downstream of Powell Falls. And I will agree that on October 19th, when I was down there, you couldn't get through the kayak launch. And it was three feet deep of muck. On November 2nd, we were able to walk on bedrock where the kayak launch was. So this river is a driftless area river, part of Wisconsin that's famous for having high sediment load streams. It is more robust and more resilient than I think people give it credit for. We just finished a sediment study where I had a geomorphologist come out here and look at each of these four reaches that's below the dam and say, how stable are these? How are they going to be impacted by removal activities? And our point so far is that this sediment that we're releasing, even if it's 33,000 yards, and I'm trying to be conservative here, so I don't want to undershoot it, but I'm trying to be conservative. I don't think that's too much. So if that's released slowly over time, it's not too much. My concern is the DNR today on the call, Kevin can verify, wanted to almost start removing this this spring. It's too fast, and you are running the risk of releasing a lot of sediment at once unless you pre-excavate all of this. So the city would have to, in my opinion, have to, to be a good steward, would have to go out there and dredge that 25,000 yards ahead of time. So 
So I guess I didn't answer your question exactly there, Scott. I tried to dance around it like a politician. Well, you did a good job. Um, <laughs> I can I can appreciate the the back and forth and and um, you know the the. the the DNR is the DNR and that's just the way they are. But, um, you know, as far as removing it beforehand, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that we're equipped, prepared, or even know where to start removing at this point in order to get to it. And, you know, we're going to start seeing thicker, thicker and thicker frost and, and uh, stabilization of the ground, you know, even in the next month and we're not, we're not ready to send something out there and nor do we have, I, nor would I have the confidence that it wouldn't sink whatever we put out there to start taking it out anyway. <clears throat> uh, Scott and Pete, Leslie Brodkowski made up a real, made a, made a really good point this afternoon in our meeting regarding this topic. She said, even if the DNR would like us to be removing sediment early, there's one thing that's in the way of that plan. And that's FERC. We have to do a decommissioning plan for FERC. And they have to review that plan. We have to square away the dam situation. There's a lot of wor work and approvals with FERC that may take 12 months to do. So the FERC is not going to have anything ready for us in February 1 to get equipment on that lake bed. It, at the earliest, I would say it'd be January of 22, at the earliest, if all dominoes came together. That's just my opinion. Pete, am I speaking correctly there, do you believe? Uh, that's exactly right. The the process has to work out. And I think that Trout Unlimited was reasonable in that where they said this needs to happen in a, a sequence where you make your decision on what you're going to do. You offer a restoration plan and you approve that. And then you offer the decommissioning plan and you approve that. And this process needs to work itself out. And as much as we don't like the idea of uncertainty of releasing sediment downstream, I'm telling you, this has happened on multiple dams across Wisconsin that have been removed. These slow pulses of, of material going downstream, and even some that I worked on where it wasn't slow, where we had a huge flood and a lot blew out at one time. The rivers are more resilient than what we're giving them credit for. Is, is some of you on the call tonight for the Utility Advisory Board may be asking themselves right now, why are we talking about this? A couple of reasons. One, it's, it's financial. Two, it's practical work. And three, this will play into the next piece that Peter's going to get into with the dam inspection report and scenarios of how we move forward. So this is why this piece is important. Do we want to go into the dam inspection? Yeah, why don't, we? why don't we? Now that we understand sediment, you might want to ask if there's any questions. Uh, Patrick, I don't know if you want to take the reins again and say, ask if there's questions and have a dialogue about it or... Oh, sure, we can do that. Um, I, I have a question. Um, the, the restoration plan was mentioned. And as I went through your email, Kevin, with all the considerations we're looking at, I just kept coming back to the question, what is our desired outcome? Um, you know, we've talked about maybe there's a falls, maybe not. Maybe it'll be a stream, maybe a lake. Um, you know, we, we're Currently, we're saying 25,000 re removal, but just as we were up on the dam looking over it, we, the question was asked, how much are we going to remove? How much do we want to remove? Um, and I, I feel it kept coming, and I'm not an expert. I'm just a guy on the utility board. But I, I just kept coming back to, how do we know what to do if we don't know what it is we want to do? <laughs> and and I, I feel like we have to work backwards from that. A little bit. And Trout Unlimited said that today, that they're, they're, they want to know what the end game is, too. Yeah. And then I, I piped up in pure Kevin fashion, and I said, well, the committee, and then I'll bring your checkbook along too. So, and he said, actually, they have Trout Limited met about that, and they might be interested in helping of a of a plan. So, but to your point, Patrick, yes, there is. We don't have a clear clear plan yet, which is, and Trout Limited does see that as a problem as well, and they potentially are, want to step forward and help with that, which I guess would be a positive. All right, guys, I'm trying to pull up my full grid and, and it's not happening. So I'm going to say if, if you've got a question, go ahead and chime in. Otherwise, we'll uh, proceed. This is Mark, uh, Mark Spafford. Um, Pete, I do have an unfair question, and that is 
we had an extreme event, probably the event, right? 500 year in June. And if we have another one of those, what? So the sediment study found in, so there's a, uh, it's a confined channel downstream, the valley going from Powell Falls down to the St. Croix. And in that channel, there is the active part where the water is flowing and then there's the floodplain. Within that confined channel, the floodplain and the storage areas for sandbars, there is far more sediment than we were talking about releasing if all 80,000 yards went downstream at once. So this 2020 July flood, I know I heard today, Kevin, that Trout Unlimited disagrees that there was, their opinion yes. is that there was more impact from the drawdown than there was from the 2020 flood. But yeah, Ken was pretty, he was pretty emphatic about that. And I, I think you and I kind of looked at each other and went, I don't think so, but that's what he but thinks. Dan Ballman of the DNR even admitted that the flood impacts are as impactful as this whole drawdown's uncertainty. So this, yeah. this idea that we did have a flood of record and it did significantly alter the downstream channel. And that channel downstream will probably still not be back into equilibrium by the time we start dam removal. So it's gonna take years for all of those sandbars and everything to come to a, a stable point. And I even heard um, a recent thing, actually I think Trout Unlimited brought it up, that this rocky run or rocky branch contributes as much sediment as like the upstream part. So again, all of these uncertainties about sediment this 80,000 yards over a 11 mile reach downstream is not that much impact. There's 200,000 yards of sediment in the lower Kenny. 200,000 yards of sediment there. So even if the entire impoundment blew out and we think 80,000 yards is gonna be released, yes, it would be a bad thing because there's gonna be this slug that's gonna move through the system and it's gonna be ugly for a time. But that 2020 flood, was almost as bad of its impact. I do another follow-up unfair question. What happens when we start to take the junction falls out, the dam out? How many how many yards will will our beautiful Kinney River that everybody wants to free be so impacted by what is going on? And now we're gonna now we're gonna dump another load down through the stream? If Is that a, even an answerable question? I, I don't know. So if you were to ask the general public who kayaks downstream of Powell Falls today, what their opinion is of this dam removal, they would say it's terrible. And probably their opinion of Powell of Junction's removal would be, you must dredge it all. But this is a very short-term opinion based on they've only seen two months of bad. If the same perspective happened at the other dam removals I've been at. There's always this ugly period at which the downstream channel looks, oh my gosh, I can't believe that black silt went down there. You know, is it ever going to recover? I mean, Grim Dam, there was 115,000 yards released. 115,000 yards in Grim. It looked terrible. Go up there today, it's beautiful. With rock rapids, the downstream channel, you can't tell it's, it's cobble again but it took probably three to four years after that dam was removed before it cleaned itself up. Again, it's these decisions, I think if you were to say, when we remove Powell Falls within the next couple of years afterward, nobody in the community would want to remove Junction without dredging it first. But give them 30 years and they're gonna say, the river restored itself downstream. So I think it's, it's this short-term perspective that we are, we are only, we are most familiar with what we saw recently. Do, do we have a reasonable expectation that if things are dredged or removed, that that restoration happens a great deal faster? Undoubtedly, but what are you, so in dredging 80,000 at somewhere between 10 and 15, are you willing to pay that $1.2 million or so to do that? Well, we've talked a lot about money. <laughs> oh, money. I, don't think that, I don't think the city is, but the stakeholders, Trout Unlimited, I mean, everything that I've heard, 
it doesn't seem like money's really a concern. Let's do it right. You know, it's all about letting the kinney go and become natural. So why would they be concerned about the money? That would be my my suggestion. I, you know, if you want a beautiful river going through there with some nice reinforced banks, maybe a little meander like it's doing right now, then let's do it. Let's do it right. But my biggest thing, and I've expressed this so many times, is that I, and I think Patrick tried to tried to just articulate it. I haven't seen a plan yet. I don't even know how or what the what the Powell Dam removal area is even going to look like when this is all done. Somebody somebody came to the table and said, "There's this beautiful falls underneath there." What? What did you? Where where'd that come from? Who even said that? And why did they say that? This, um, I don't know. Uh, Pete, I think you used the right word earlier, and that's we have to be the good stewards. And, and um, without a plan, it's just, you know, leave it open and letting stuff flush and flush and flush. Pretty soon it, we'll have all 80,000 yards down there. And then what do we have? We got a messed up river because it's going to take years for it to clean itself. So, okay. Well, I'm going to encourage Trout Unlimited to turn over a couple more rocks on a restoration plan to see what they're thinking and if that matches our plan. Because you're, you guys are both right. We need a plan. That was going to actually be part of Pete's decommissioning plan. There was going to be a piece about restoration in there. So you might want to hit, but I don't know how elaborate that was going to be, Pete. Um, well, if you remember at the uh, January or February meeting that we had about this, that was the most contested part of the entire meeting. So we had got done talking about the dam removal and the methods and where we're we going to put the sediment and, and all of this. And the biggest outcry that we had was the restoration plan. They couldn't believe that I was going to use riprap and uh, willow trees to stabilize this. It was a trout stream, right? So those are the two worst things, apparently, that you can use on a trout stream. So at that point, we said, you know, Trout Unlimited, you guys have the expertise and you have a very close relationship with the DNR who already does these things. Why not take that off of us? You know, all we have to do is submit the bare bones to the FERC for approval. The FERC doesn't care about what the river looks like afterward, just removing the dam. So we can submit the bare bones, but we, I would be happy to turn this over to Trout Unlimited and say, you guys prepare a plan. And tell me what you want as far as earthwork removal, and then we can have that done as part of this project. Or you can get the DNR, who also does this earthwork and part of their projects. So, And they can pay for it. I said, bring your checkbook. <laughs> so... Uh, so I just want to just backtrack this a little bit too. And I talked about Kent and his uh, estimates of sediment downstream. And I kind of poo-pooed that, you know, Kent has his opinions and I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I was belittling that opinion or anything. It's just with a different opinion. That's all. And Kent's an expert. He has his opinions as well. So I want to be careful there. Yeah. He raises a lot of good questions, which makes us think, and I, I appreciate that too. But again, you get five geomorphologists in the same room, you're going to get five different. Or six Look different out. Things. Yeah. <laughs> so, Pete, why don't we just keep keep this thing rolling and uh, let's keep this river moving? Okay. So the inspection, basically in a nutshell, the most concerning thing that we had was these post-tension anchors, these rock bolts that were bolting all these lifts of concrete. This is the upstream face of Powell Falls that you're seeing in front of you. There's these lifts every two to three feet. Uh, they were not well bonded. So 1988, they came through and jacked it all together with uh, inch and three-eighths bolts. So biggest fear that we had was something happened during the flood that shifted that or changed it. Um, we did not find that. So the inspection report that's in your binder shows what we did find, which is, I think, what we expected. There's there's cracks and there's things that don't look good. But again, that's why you're removing this dam. But there's nothing that I found that was an immediate safety concern with the post-tension anchor part of this spillway. I did find one crack that was concerning. I'm not sure 
how far to take it with the FERC, and I'm still thinking about how what to write about this, but there's a diagonal crack in the sluice way. And this could have been caused by ice forces pushing against the sluice gate because they're that's one area where the ice could get trapped and expand and push that top uh, part that's between the powerhouse and the spillway, it could spread it apart. So the sluiceway crack was concerning. The worst part obviously was this right abutment where we have um, still seepage, even after a full drawdown, we still have a good amount of seepage over here. The, the bedrock is in terrible condition. I think one of the main things, let's see if I can find a picture here that I was trying to get at in the report was, I'm not so certain that you could even drill bolts through this bedrock to anchor our new wall. So we might need, if you were going to refill this, we would have to build a bigger wall than I had first thought. So I think I told Kevin something like, oh yeah, you know, 27 cubic feet of concrete, you could fix this. But after looking at this in more detail, this fractured bedrock is going to take something to some more effort and thought to fix. Uh, the DNR even mentioned that even on a state dam, this is concerning. You have all of the seepage coming through here. And so they were even suggesting grouting. And honestly, the FERC could say the same thing, that there's a lot of seepage on this right bank, and there is a potential that this bedrock is not structurally sufficient to hold up all the flood. So um, I, I still need some more thought in that, but at a minimum, before you were to refill this dam, if you would choose that path, you would have to add a lot more of concrete wall over here. Yes, Mark? Peter, interject something really quick so the the business that i'm in um, we use soil anchor nails and they are driven not horizontally into the bank but uh, at a little bit of an angle and then shot created the face and it is integrity is fantastic so yeah that um, might that would be a good solution here i think the the soil nailing the only thing that you would have to worry about is the drainage blanket back behind it and i know you guys use probably the a big geogrid you can use around house foundations, but the seepage on this corner here, it's concerning because the rock is porous. It's also concerning because it's probably degrading the bedrock strength. So whether you did soil nailing or what, I think at the end of the day, if we choose to fix this, we need to show to the FERC that this is stable enough for whatever design load they have. Um, so I, again, the bedrock, just looking at it, it's pretty poor condition. Just no wonder why the whole top of the wall probably sheared off, you know, is a, is a single block, this, this wall that used to be here. Um, there was a, some small repairs. I mean, it's no surprise, right? You got a 1968 structure, there's concrete small repairs. The irony, I believe, is Brian was telling me he had patched these, you know, a short time before this flood came. So um, patches may not have even had time to set up. So. If we wanted to refill it, we'd have to patch those again. Some big cracks in the middle of the dam, and I don't think anybody was surprised by this. It, it's in rough condition. You know, there's some, I don't know that these are necessarily dam safety, but they're just another indication of why we're removing the dam and choosing to go this route. The big issue that I did not expect was the gate. The stem is bent. Get this, uh, I think it's a eight inch or a 10 inch S beam is bent sideways, and the bottom of the gate has been hit with a looks like a big log strike. So, if we are going to go with this continued operation of the dam exactly as it is today for three more years, one of my recommendations is you've got to fix this gate and make it operable and reliable. So, to me, that's that's a repair that I did not expect. You can also see this crack that I was talking about earlier here, this diagonal crack, basically the whole top of the sluice way looks like it's starting to separate out. Um, could be ice, could be, who knows. Trash rack has got a lot of cleaning to do. There's sand upstream of the trash rack. If we wanna refill this lake, you know, we're gonna have to clean this trash rack off and get the powerhouse back up and operational. Most of these trash racks can't take more than six inches of head differential between the water that's outside the rack and the water that's inside. So when something's plugged, you know, like 30 to 40% like this, you can start to fail these racks. So that was it. I looked at junction as well, just to see that there was no scour down there and I wrote that up. The big part is Kevin was getting as, I believe there's three options. Option one, you repair and refill the dam. 
Option two, we continue as the dam is today for the, you know, till 2023 when we get the, the new license. So that's option two. So option one is repair and refill. Option two is we continue as we are today. And option three is we strive to limit the bouncing of the lake by cutting a bigger hole in the dam. And you can go into those options. Um, the DNR, I was surprised somebody actually asked about cost, and the DNR never asks about cost, right? But somebody actually asked about cost on that call. So I, I believe, you know, I, looking at some numbers here, option one is probably around $100,000 to get this whole dam back up to where the FERC is going to expect it to be to refill and continue regular operations until 2023. That's just a ballpark number, probably 30, 40% accuracy I made up today as I was thinking through this. Option number two, keep the power falls drawn down. This isn't free because I think Brian and the operation crew there need to have a reliable gate system. So I think you've got to get away from this manually operated hand gate. Put something on there that has a motor and it's, you know, the motor itself is probably a $8,000 deal, but that gate, it could be 15,000. I don't know how much it's going to be to get a crane in there and pull that gate out and repair it so that it's not bent on the bottom like that and the, and the stem is not bent. So I think option two is 15, 20, or 15 to 30,000 range. Option three, this is where the sky is the limit. Somewhere between where we are today and full removal is option three. How big of a hole do we want to cut in this dam? How, big of a, how much of a lake bounce can we accept? How much sediment can we accept being blown out in a single event going downstream? So. I think option three is most expensive, but as the DNR pointed out today, it's a step towards decommissioning. So costs that you spend on option three, while not one-to-one, -one, they do partially take away from costs that you'll have to spend later. Any questions? Put a, can you put a price tag on option three? Do you dare give me a range? Give the group a range, because they're all thinking it. I'm gonna copy my email here so I give them the same number I gave you. Does option one include turning the hydro back on, Kevin? Yes. Yes, it does. All right, so I'm going to... How much money would we expect to get out of the hydro between now and 2023? It's about 40000 a year, roughly. It would easily pay for its repair. Yeah. Option one is more than 100,000. I think it was like 105. It's close. That was just my ballpark of the different steps that were in there. Option two, 15 to 30 thousand dollars for a reliable gate and operation system. And then option three, if you just did the sluice way, so basically cutting the sluice way gate straight up to the the deck. I think that concrete removal and getting a contractor to come to the site, and crane everything out. Probably have some dewatering challenges. I think that's probably a 65. So you got in the, the biggest thing with option three, though, is whatever we do with some major modification is going to have to go through FERC. Probably going to take 90 days to 120 days of FERC review. It's option two, we don't really need a FERC permit to do. Option three, we need a FERC permit. So that's why I think at a minimum, it's 100,000. If you open up the powerhouse, you're looking in excess of 200,000. To reiterate, Pete, though, that's money you'll have to spend now or later if you're going to take the dam off. Kind of. You know, as I said in my notes, though, it's not exactly correct. I mean, yeah, Sheriff and the DNR mentioned that, but when a contractor comes for a small job, you're paying for mobilization, you're paying correct. for the crane that's not being spread out amongst other projects. Mm -hmm. A lot of this cost is going to be getting the contractor to come to the site and mobilize. You might recover half of this. Kevin, what um, what was the promise that the city council gave to the public when they agreed to the 2026? That the dam would come, the dam would be come out in 2026 by 2026. I, and the, the hydro dam, would continue to run until then. Um, I think we were going. To, yeah, I'm trying no, to remember. There, I don't think so. I think no, I don't. There was a there was a period of time. Sorry for interrupting. There was a period yeah. of time for, prior to the hydro 
where we had to draw it down and we'd have to, mm -hmm. we'd have to cease hydro operations and then draw it down. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm thinking ceasing operations in early 20, if I remember correctly, then it was a couple of years for drawdown engineering and then removal in 2026. Mm -hmm. Something okay. like that timeline. Pete, I'm I'm wondering if if we removed the twenty five thousand cubic yards, do we have any expectation that the remaining fifty five stays in place? So there's yeah. So the eighty thousand yards is the volume within the channel. Mm -hmm. There's two hundred thousand thousand yards in the impoundment. Mm -hmm. One big key understanding of this is that the channel is stable when we leave it because we don't want it cutting into the other number that's above there. So this 25,000 is, is probably the remaining volume of steep banks of channel that's not wide enough and material that's up next to the dam that we need to remove. That's just proactive risk reduction measures, it's no guarantee that this channel isn't going to move later on. And we had that argument with the uh, Trout Unlimited about are your biologic engineering methods that you're using going to be as stable and robust at, at holding this channel where you want it? Because it could still move later on. So it's, tell me if I didn't answer your question. Uh not completely to be to be honest but I, I understand that it's we don't know what it'll do so i, I get it um uh, i'm trying to think if i can rephrase so i i mean you're in, in this group you're the expert that's that's what we're looking to you for and and that means a lot you know um so i i'm not looking to to pin you down with a hey tell us what to do uh at the same time I don't know, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm looking for a place to, to put my confidence, to put it bluntly. So. I'm a little biased toward the mindset of doing things quickly. I think a lot of natural processes are better done by nature. And I think this channel is not stable where it's at today and we will not be able to predict with certainty where the stable channel will be. But I think if we wait three more years before we remove the whole dam and lose all ability to retain sediment, I think we're gonna give this channel a shot to stabilize. And then we have a good chance of wherever it's at, we can keep it there. I struggle with the idea that, you know, even heaven forbid we get FERC approval to remove this dam in 2021. What would we do to minimize this risk? I think your risk as a city, if you are concerned about the lower reach of the Kinney, is to not remove this dam in a single year, the first year after it was drawn down. Those sediments are loose. They haven't stabilized. There's no compaction out there. You're running a big risk of having a flood event wash it all or wash a lot of it downstream. I'm encouraged by what the geomorphologists said downstream that the channel has a large capacity to absorb sediment on the flood plains. And it, it's a pool and riffle system. The pools fill up like they did after our drawdown, the first pool, 600 feet long, three foot deep, 50 foot wide, filled up. But then that pool is cut slowly over time afterward. And that's how the system works is that it's basically one cup dumping into another cup, dumping into another cup going downstream. So with that said, I, I think the natural process is what I would prefer as an engineer because I don't have confidence that we can escape this risk of having a large blowout. Pete, can you take us out to the St. Croix? And can you tell us about when these dunes are moving and migrating over the years? What happens once they get to the St. Croix? What does the Corps of Engineers say? What does the DNR say? Yeah, that, I mean, obviously the concern at St. Croix is the mussels that are down in there, endangered species of mussels. Um, the St. Croix has been receiving sediment from the Kinney for a long time. You can see on an aerial photo that there's a bar that is enormous at the end of the Kinney. A lot of theories about where that bar came from. 
I think recently some opinions are that the Rocky Run branch, or whatever, is responsible for a lot of that. But this 80,000 yards even is a drop in the bucket compared to what that volume of that bar is at the mouth of the Kinney. So we're talking, what, 40 acres down there, which is the area of Powell Falls. And it's all sandbar that's, I don't know, in places there's oak trees that are growing that are a foot around. So the bar has been there a long time. You know, the sediment that's going down the system right now, I think even from the flood is, is not yet at the end of the bar. There's a lot of woody debris down there, but the sediment is still in the lower Kenny around County F. And you can see that, I don't know if I saw my photos over there, but um, I don't know my photos open, but there's still sand moving through the system. So what's gonna to happen to that sand? It's gonna go down the mouth of the Kinney. It's gonna go out into the, the St. Croix and the, the current from the St. Croix is gonna push the sediment along the shore. So the most of the Kinney sediment ends up lengthening that bar in a north-south direction. So it won't block the St. Croix, but the DNR's concern, I believe, is that there's mussel beds on that uh, St. Croix River along those banks. And they don't want them to be smothered by the sediment coming out. So, so Kevin, this might take us all the way back to when we started talking about the studies and the mussels and uh, the, the alert that I brought to the table saying that we may have to invest in muscle in the St. Croix. And, and that can get very, very expensive. Right, because to your point, Mark, that you are making is with the muscle study and all these studies, you're setting baselines. Is that the point you're making? And then if the baseline has been moved, who's responsible for that? Question mark. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but Mark, because it's your profession, you know that area and you know that could be on the horizon. Yep. If, something to, if something I'm to think about. If I'm hearing Pete correctly, though, I mean, I, I mean, I'm really encouraged to hear him use the word resilient in reference to the river and, and that even with the, and it's, it's not just the one flood. We had, we've had two floods recently. I mean, there's been a lot of water in those two events and, and a lot of drama. Uh, I went and watched both of them. Uh, there were trees getting thrown around. Um, it was a pretty dramatic event. And to hear the word resilient used after that is really encouraging to me. And I'm, Mark, I share your concern about being responsible and not letting this happen too quickly. And I, I'd like clean water and I'd like everyone to be as happy as can be. Um, but I'm coming back to what's our responsibility and, you know, we don't have any money on the table yet and how simple can we make this and just trying to connect all these facts. Um, we're not voting on anything. This is a conversation, but um, we'll, we'll come to that point. So um, uh, I'm sharing my thoughts here. So, you know, and as, you're, and as you're talking and as Mark is talking and others are thinking, be sharing, you know, I was a little bit concerned that January 19th was kind of out there for us, maybe too far out there to make a decision. I'm glad it's January 19th because between now and January 19th, you're going to have a lot of questions and we're going to get more information. This is really going to help us make a better decision on January 19th. So this is a really, speaking of baselines, this is a really good baseline of information that's going to make you think about a lot of things. And we have a lot of experts out there they're going to help us get to the get to a better decision on January 19th. Agreed. I I don't think we need to do anything official to to ask this question, but can we begin to get in conversation what Trout Unlimited, the DNR, and other stakeholders believe their desired outcome is, so that we have. It's, it's know, like it's like you're a fly on the wall today in the yeah, conversation because. Very good. I encouraged them. I said, I don't know exactly how you folks are thinking. It would be helpful to know. I said, share your opinions because it will help shape policy potentially. You know, depending on what the policymakers think of your group, it could work against you. I'm not sure. But um, I said, it'd be good for policymakers to know what the DNR is thinking 
and what their preferred angle is and Toronto Limited, what, what would you prefer? Because when we go to FERC to have all of our stakeholders and policymakers lined up with a common theme without outliers, it'll really assist us in, in convincing FERC that this is the right thing to do. So yes, they will be sharing that, I do believe, Patrick, probably maybe by the, as early as middle of December. Do you okay. want to tell them, Kevin, what they said? I mean, they did commit. On this they call committed. Verbally. They said they verbally. Both the DNR and Charter Limited said we should leave it down <laughs> and do option three. Yes. Wow. Um, Kent from Charter Limited, so you said there'd be no environmental upside to keeping the dam and not and not to refilling. That's what he, I, that was a quote I wrote down. Yep. And the DNR, and the DNR said they don't want to go through this again with the with the sediment so that was their verbal verbal take on it today and i said please share that with folks so people know and then reasons why i appreciate that and i've heard that statement made several times but every time i hear it i feel like we're we're throwing out just that gamble of what if it rains really hard <laughs> um it, it, but what we're we're what I'm hearing is that that falls with an acceptable risk. And and I don't like saying that, but that's, mm -hmm. is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing? Pete had that in February. Pete is when you gave your, your early decommissioning plan. And that question came up, Patrick, when does the sediment go downstream? And Pete said, tell me when it rains four to six inches and I'll tell you when the sediment's going downstream. Exactly. So, and, but, but again, acceptable risk is how I'm hearing it. I just want to say it bluntly. So, Mark, is that? I have a yes. quick comment, Patrick, if you're okay with that. Yes, please. The reason, Kevin, for opening the gate and drawing it down was to inspect the dam. Correct. We've only lost 8,000 cubic yards so far. That's, that's pretty minimal compared to what happened in July. Our agreement with the city council made with the public was that we would wait. So the DNR's concern in my mind that they don't wanna go through this again, what does that mean? That's only 8,000 cubic yards. It's gonna fill it back up again. The sediment, right? Pete, the, the sediment will fill that meandering channel back up again. It's a time thing. So we lost 8,000 yards from possibly, what? so we lost maybe 1,000 yards in the first 12 days of drawdown. And we lost 7,000 yards in like four days. So that slug effect is what is the detriment that everybody's scared of. How many slugs like that can we live with? And Cheryl Latch of the DNR on the call today she asked basically what was her opinion of what we should do. She said, remove it today, like in 2021, remove the dam. But that's kind of blind to the risk because then what's holding back this sediment? So the DNR is concerned that 7,000 yards coming in four days is a big slug of system that the system can't handle and there's going to be losses. And as Kent will say, it's not the trout. It's the invertebrates that the trout are eating mm -hmm. that are smothered by this sediment and the slug mm -hmm. of it going downstream. If you were to release 7,000 yards over a period of three months, probably no one would see that impact downstream, but we saw it as two and a half feet of muck in that first pool downstream of Powell Falls. So it's that amount per short period, or it's the rate at which it's passed downstream that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. This river as a whole takes between five and 10,000 yards a year downstream at Powell Falls. It's, it's been pretty clean, right? It's looked really good. No one sees the effects of that because it's so spread out, 1,000 yards a month here and there, you know, whatever it is, 50 tons a day or 50 cubic yards a day. That rate is slow enough, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Well, these questions you have, write them down and get them in. Because if we don't get a lot of these questions answered before January 19th, we'll have an eight hour meeting. 
and we might need another one. So um, we need to start, you know, there's no bad questions, craft your questions, we'll get answers. Um, this, this, is, this is gonna be a really tough decision, really tough. This is worse than the biosolids one. <laughs> so again, impactful for uh, for the our city forever, just like the biosolids. So these are impactful. Your guys, you, you folks are all asking the right questions tonight. Keep asking them, get them in early, get them in often. We can get answers. And um, I hope city council watches this too. Scott, you might want to encourage them and uh, Scott Morissette. Yeah. This, this, this is, this is meat and potatoes for helping them make their decision as well on the 19th of January. I think, I think this decision is not going to be. Going into a time break here is that, is that we've got these stakeholders and we've got these. These, these these different federal bodies and state bodies telling us what to do, um, and you know I, I've used the term OPM, um, other people's money. It's it, 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 that's fine. You know, I would on consideration. Uh, I'm not going to commit to it, but I would probably do some strong consideration today. get the fee to the pay for I'd probably have strong consideration of that. Um, but, but right now we don't have the money. And we've committed the, the other thing that the city council did in that, in that March 27, 28 meeting, 2018 was commit that no general fund monies are going to be used for this, um, which limits to a certain extent what can be from a standpoint of utility it's fine for them to tell them for the hour to tell us to take it out I mean, if we want if we want this thing to stabilize and, and be responsible with it the, the more responsible thing from my standpoint it sounds like let's just let it settle down so everybody take a breath um you know trout unlimited has made no bones about the fact that they want the the the, the dam out now um, and you know all the other stakeholders want the dam out right now, uh, and that's fine. But but when they come up and say, you know, you got to remove the dam, his internet's gone. <laughs> so I, I'm going to build on that because I after so Pete after uh, we got off the call, I got a call right away from one of the people on that call, and um, the person I talked to said he was familiar with the state's budgeting process and budget cycles. He said, we should be talking to our local representatives. He said the city of Arcadia and the village of Pulver both got into the state budget cycle and had, I hate to call it an earmark, but they had it labeled right for their project. Arcadia got 14 and a half million and Pulver got a couple million dollars to do their damn projects. He said, we should be immediately talking to our state representatives to see if we can get into the budget cycle and maybe have it funded that way. And I said, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. So, so I'm going to work on, I'm going to probably turn over some rocks on that here in early December as well. Okay. Kevin, I just, just Patrick, I just, one quick. Yep. yep. <clears throat> I don't know what everybody has an opinion of my opinion right now, but I'm not trying to stop the dam removal. Okay, that's already been decided, and I'm good with that. It's it's these other little details, right? It's all about the details, and it's all about the money. It's always about the money. So um, I just wanted to be clear about that. Thank you. Yep, I appreciate that, Mark, and I feel like what Scott was saying was in the same spirit. You know, we want to uh, keep our promises uh, as well as be the best possible steward. Um, it's just that there are so many angles to this. So you're, you're asking great questions. So I'm, I'm with you on the concerns. So thanks. Uh, having said that, we have time for further questions and I feel like we've exhausted the time we should take on that for, for tonight. So I, I'd like to move to uh, 
number five on our agenda, which is the COVID-19 UW Madison Wastewater Study Participation Report. Sure. Ron is with us. He might be able to give a couple words on that. And I want to say, Pete, if you're still on, thank you, Mr. Haug, for giving that presentation. I appreciate that. And then also all you UAB members, thank you too for hanging in there on that tough subject. Yep. Thank, thank you, Pete. That was excellent. Yep. Ron, are you still with us? And can you talk to the COVID-19 update at all? Do you have anything on that? Yeah. I know I saw some graphs. So, yeah, we get a little bit of information. We, um, I think they gave us some stuff through the mid-October. So initially what the what the numbers showed was, um, and it's kind of preliminary yet, they, they really aren't giving us a good, uh, uh, you know, explanation other than the um, gram colonies per liter that they're measuring. Um, so what we saw was kind of mid-September through end of September, there was a little bit of a spike, dropped off again beginning of October. It started coming up middle mid-October, and those are the last numbers I have, I would expect. Um, we were going to see higher numbers from here on out, but uh, I haven't got any further information yet. So there, there is COVID-19 in our wastewater stream. Some of your samples are a little bit worse than others, but it's really tough to right. know right. And, to and interpret you know, they, yeah like they said too it's tough to compare to other cities it's it's kind of it's almost system specific because of hydraulics and all that kind of stuff so we got a you know long term you compare it i mean someday this information might be valuable i think it's you know right now it's basically for its um study purposes um you know maybe sometime in the future they can pin this stuff down and it'll, it'll really mean something but right now it's a little up in the air Anything further on that? I mean, looking, we're looking for more information in the future. That, that sounds good. So thanks, Ron. All right, moving on to point six. We're at our finance report. Yeah, I have that in front of me. I sent you folks, Mark, you might not have got it because I hit my UAB all again. I, I, I sent it with the other documents. I don't think you got it. I sent everybody our top 20 customers and the so our, 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 first, our top 20 accounts, some of those customers have duplicate accounts, including the UW and the school district and best made cookies and some of the other ones. But anyway, it showed that our top 20 accounts in the first 11 months of 2019, we were down just under $500,000 in, in uh, income that we saw the previous year. So. So, when, so that is my segue to, to talk about our electric utility uh, revenues, expenses over revenues. And you can see that year to date electric fund, we have 11.1 .1 million revenues and 11.4 million in expenses, a $300,000 Delta there. We do have about $150,000 coming in uh, that the UW owes us for work on their substation. So that'll trim that down. Tracy Biederman also has some work to do with expensing some of these numbers differently. So we're actually, we're going to end up pretty close, but I wanted just to tell you again that our revenues, just with our top 20 customers alone, are down about uh, just under $500,000 in 2020 compared to 2019. So a little bit of the reasoning for that. Water funds doing great. Uh, revenues, 2.2 million. Expenses, 1.4 million. It's amazing. So with COVID-19, there's some negative effects with electric, but some positive effects with water. You can tell people are home. Um, they're showering later in the day, I think, but uh, people are home and they're using more water this year than we did in 2019. So good for water. And that relates to the sewer fund as well. Revenues, 3 million, expenses, 2.4 million. Stormwater fund, 629,000, expenses, 454. So doing good everywhere electric has definitely felt the ding with the university um and a more limited basis and the school district was a limited basis last spring so that's where um we've been affected there you can see these aging reports uh, we're getting quite a few uh payments that are uh, falling further and further behind so i made a joke on that and wppi executive team meeting 
So we're not alone there. All you, all you, all of our 51 members are, are feeling this pain with, with non-payments. A couple other common threads there. I said that our local nonprofits have handed out less or they've assisted less utility customers this year than they have in the past. It seems counterintuitive, right? More people need help, less people are seeking help because there is no threat of disconnect. So the human nature part kicks in, they let it ride. We're not the only ones feeling that. Everybody else that was uh, all of all their 11 executive team members said they were experiencing the same things in their community where people are falling farther, farther behind, but they're seeking less help to get that caught up because of the no threat to disconnect. So that is a common thread. Um, and then I was joking and I said, well, maybe we should get people's attention. We should just do a special assessment on all rate payers and have them pay for the non-payers as a joke to get people's attention. And then Mike Peters, the CEO and president of WPPI, he said, actually, we said we, they have gone to the PSC and said, maybe it'd be like a, um, every month we get a, uh, you get a, you can get a fee for, uh, what's, what's what I'm looking for? Morris, Mr. Morissette talking too much what do you what do you call it when you do catch up every month oh I'm just brains like, dying. A, like price leveling or something yeah what do you call that what do you, are we it's on the it's the three three let three letters Whatever. for the uh every month so you can catch up if the if, if the we if our wholesale bills higher we pay we we're able to pass that along every month on the utility bill oh what do you call it? it's just a line item on there every month anyway we are able to What's that? It's PCAC charge. PCAC, power cost adjustment charge. Thank you. It's getting late in the day and my mind's been going since seven. So the power cost adjustment charge. And then, so he said, Mike Peterson, they, they've actually brought that up to the, they, they brought that up to the PSC and saying, hey, maybe they, we just can pass that along as a power cost adjustment charge to all customers so utilities can recoup these non-payments. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think the paying customers are going to like that too much, but. It's been brought up. How do you folks feel about that? You think paying customers should pay for the non-payers? Some might like it. I don't know. Anyway, it's being sorted. So you can see we're at record highs, 165,000. Can I jump in? Yeah, please. We, we talked about, I, I asked if we could maybe do a, another mailing to those, to the drop-offs and 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 see if we got any response from that essentially reminding them hey there's help available and you'd be better off if you took it did, yeah did, did that happen yes it did i think it is funny because i i the next day i went and uh, i asked the, them about that and they did it like a day before our meeting so they did do that again yes they did yep they did and was there has, has there been response um it was, more it was more tempered this time because last time we did it, uh, it was during a two week stretch when the PSC said we might be able to disconnect again in, a, in about three weeks. So we were, we were telling the truth and said, hey, we got this window, get caught up, or we're, you, disconnect is coming back on in like August 17th or whatever it was. This time we didn't have that threat in there again, so it fell more on deaf ears. But yes, we did send a letter out again, Patrick. And on top of that, our front desk, they, they do personal calls to like the top 90 that are behind over $500. So we do we do letters and personal calls to the people that are 500 or more behind. So related, related note. So mm -hmm. we're looking at an awful lot of development around town right now. Mm -hmm. do, we have an, do we have an expectation that we'll just have more customers in the near future and that that'll be beneficial? Um, yeah, so actually I have, Stacy Running, she's our WPPI rep. Just a couple of days ago, sometime this week, I gave, I commissioned her to, I said, Stacy, look at all of our new development, whether it be single family or multifamily construction in the last 24 months. And I wanna know how many meters we put on water and electric, and can we quantify what that has brought to our utility? So I'm gonna, and I said, I just, by mid January, I gave her to get that completed. But I want to quantify exactly how many new meters we've installed on multifamily and single family in the last 24 months, and then get a get an idea of a, about how much revenue that's brought to our utility. Because I under, I believe that some of this is 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 helping our utility just in revenues. Well, every meter is 12 bucks a month, so for electric. So yes, 
I was, I'm thinking along those lines too, Patrick. Great question. So that's really what I had in the financial report. Everything is really good. Electric, we're, we're working on it. Um, that's all I have there, Patrick. Very good. I, I don't want to be the guy asking all the questions at the end of the meeting, but I, this one, when you talked about the water and the electric, does, mm -hmm. the utility, does the utility as a business have the ability to, you know, have transferability within accounts? I mean, if, if these trends aren't resolved soon, I mean, we can't let the electric hurt Correct. too badly. Correct. There's a little bit of flexibility at the end of the year for electric. You might be able to to work with thirty or forty thousand dollars, but they're separate silos for water, electric, and wastewater. So you cannot go between those two. But there are ways to maybe to work with electric. A lot of the electric funds too. There's there's some unusual accounting uh, with electric, and there's the way you do work in different categories. Uh, capital improvements, for example, are accounted for in different ways, expense wise, than just day to day work. So we have to go back in and say what were capital projects this year versus not capital projects. So those numbers that you I showed you tonight are going to look better at the end of the year and will be close. But so there is some room to move the stuff around a little bit. But I'm definitely on track for that. And on top of that, Patrick, I'm, we've already accounted for a little bit less revenue in 21 for electric. I'm going to go back in January and even look at our expenses and see if there's anything else we can cut for 21. But, okay. with, our new, but with our new rate structure, I think we're going to be okay and some of our estimates for usage next year. But I'm going to go look at that again as well. All right. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, do we need to take a look at the dashboards? And I'll just invite you to to take us home, Kevin. Yeah, I think those are pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, what got my attention was looking at the uh, October electric sales by class. You look at the large commercials and the public authorities. I don't even know what page that's on. It's a blue and red bar graph, October electric sales by class. And boy, you can see large commercial was down, public authority down. And I was looking at that going, what is going on? So that's when I went to the top 20 and said, what is going on? And yeah, we're down, uh, you know, $500,000 between those two. And, you know, I, I kind of hate, I really don't want to say exactly what companies, but I can say university and school district. And you say, well, what, else, what other public authority buildings? Well, city hall, library, these are facilities that are not using as much electricity in 2020 as they were in 2019, just because they're not occupied, we're all working at home. So that it's having an impact. So that's why I think those the bar graphs are good and uh, free to look at. They're pretty self-explanatory. So hopefully that helps. Always open for questions. If you see something after the meeting or something you didn't feel comfortable asking me, you know, please please feel free to give me an email as well. I know another question you folks asked last time. I did some research on it. Somebody asked if we were to go get a $2.5 million bond for the dam, what would, what impact would that have on rate payers? So that question was asked and I did get an answer to that. A bunch of people were hitting their computer and it'd be, a, so two and a half million dollar would be $125,000 a year for 25 years. That'd be a 0.75% increase in our revenue requirement. So then I extrapolated it out. It's a little over a dollar a month per customer. So, so you say, well, how much would a $2.5 million uh, bond impact ratepayers for 20 years? It's about, you know, roughly 15 bucks a year for a residential customer. I don't know, is that a lot or not? I don't know, it's real money. So, that, so I want to let you know I did get an I did research that and try to get an answer for you. That's something to think about. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, some of well, how much, well, that's a, people say, well, how much two point five million dollar bond? How does it impact ratepayers? Well, that's about about fifteen bucks a year, roughly, give or take a little. Now, I don't know if it's that's not to some people that's a lot. Some people it's not, but it's real money. Over 20 years. Yep. All so right. that's my, any other questions on the finances from folks? 
Hey, I, I, I know a positive update. Ron, do you want to talk about uh, yesterday? Uh, you guys turned on your first ditch and turned on the blowers and got some uh, aeration going on down there. Uh, that's worth mentioning, Ron. Sure. Yeah, we uh, had our first full night of operation last night. We did some preliminary testing, everything coming through real good, our ammonia levels. First ammonia we pulled was actually below detect levels. So, um, and I think we're, you know, it's going to take some time to see, but I mean, just overnight it was evident how much our power consumption dropped on that new system compared to what we had. So, um, yeah, I'll give you, a, you know, another month we should have some better numbers, but uh, so far so good. Power consumption drop. Here we go. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> It's just what we don't that, but, uh, Yeah, it did. I mean, it's, uh, plug in a space, plug in a space heater or something, would you out there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it'll it'll be coming up here. Um, so I mean, for winter, but maybe we could look at an electric sludge dryer or something like that. For, uh, yeah. I like it. <laughs> so anyway, I thought that was good, Ron. You want that project to be completed by the end of the year? You believe then? Ditch two. Uh, yeah, they should get going on the second ditch. Shouldn't take near as long. Most of the infrastructure's in place. Uh, I'm hoping here, um, you know, second week of December, they're scheduling startup. I don't know if they're going to do it that quick, but um, before Christmas, it's got to happen. So, you happy with your contractor? He's been. They've been good. I mean, yeah, they. Uh, you know, there's always a few little things here and there. Um, even with. You know, there's some of these, some of the guys have been out on quarantine, other things, um, you know, but through it all, they've worked through it. It's maybe a few days here and there, but it, it's been pretty, pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Ron's group had a water main break they repaired on Broadway last week, put uh, quite a few customers out of water for six, seven hours, handled that, hit some bedrock, but got that taken care of. We're going to talk a little bit about that, Ron. Yeah, we had uh, we actually had it start on a Friday. We left it go through the weekend just because there were so many customers out. Try to get everybody notification, get it at an acceptable time. Um, went pretty good. Um, it could have been worse. We had a little trouble finding it at first, but like Kevin said, it was right down tight on bedrock. So had to chip some bedrock away to get our repair clamp in. But uh, guys did a great job. Had to shut off a lot of valves, filled the system back up again. Um, you know, bled everything, got very little air, cleaned up the water pretty quick. So all in all, it went pretty well. Those are the types of things that you know, people don't pay much attention to, but those are a lot of work and they're fussy and a lot of regulation to get that water going and stay clean and get people back in as soon as you can. So good job with that. Any other questions? I don't have many other announcements or anything like that. I think I've covered everything in my notes. I mean, boy, I tell you what, what a week. You guys have given up a lot this week. Um, it's amazing because we we go many months and don't have many heavy subjects, and then we throw this on you. And I really appreciate all of you taking the time. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of effort you have to put into that. So thank you. And be thinking about the 19th of January. January. We probably won't have a meeting in December, so probably take December off. I know the council doesn't have a meeting, the second meeting in December either. So we'll probably pause in December and then we'll crank it back up in uh, January. You know, the meeting on Monday and then Tuesday night will be the work session with the council. Very good. So, all right. Uh, Matt, I want to say thanks for, for being with us as kind of a, an intro. And apparently you've got some time between now and, and January to to jump in with both feet. Uh, I, I just want to share with you that I have been impressed over and over again with, with city staff and how they uh, they will take time to make sure you're uh, educated, whether that be electric or other, you know, pick your, pick your department. Uh, if you reach out to them, they'll, they're, we've taken tours. We've um, had a great many points of education and that's what enables us to do this well. So welcome to the crew and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, having said that, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Move adjournment. I'll second it. Very good. Folks, We I formally adjourn our, our meeting and we'll see you in January.
Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah.